let's, uh, we'll, we'll pray and we'll, let's just jump right in. Lord, Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for a weekend to worship you. For those of us who do get a chance to enjoy a day off tomorrow, we say, uh, we say thank you. For those who are starting new school years and new rhythms in the fall, we do say thank you. And Lord, uh, for breath and the ability to sit in this beautiful room and to enjoy friendship and a meal, we're just, uh, we're really grateful, God. We don't stop to say thank you enough. So here we are. Now open our eyes and ears to see and hear what you have to say to us so that we would really live. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, amen. Amen. So we're in a series called Follow Me. This is week three. And I thought I'd start with bearing uh, my soul. When you communicate with people, I'm a, I'm a communicator by nature, you could do it vocally, you know, through words here you're listening, or you could also write. So I've I've written a couple of books and articles and stuff like that, but I also write cards. I'm a poet. And so uh, I, I don't work for Hallmark, but I, I do write cards. So I wanna, I'm going to give you a card that I wrote. Uh, yes, it's actually dated. It's dated 12-25-1991. Um, uh, 90s, baby. Some of you need to Google that. And uh, so what I did was, uh, fellas, I'm trying to help you out, a three-part card uh, for then my girlfriend, Carmen, Christmas card. Think about this, gentlemen. So it was, it was the night before Christmas and all through my mind, memories of you were so easy to find. <laughs> oh, it gets better. As I thought of the time that we very first met, I never gave up and I didn't regret waiting and watching until the day no more trouble from parents. Her dad had threatened to kill me. <laughs> Seriously. Your boyfriend, I'll stay. Those early months were so precious and true, a time where I gave up my heart all to you. And that was part one of the card. Oh, there's more, part two. <laughs> that was about our past. We've been dating for three years. I wanted to marry her. I told her I was going to marry her within two months. And I just driven and dumb but accurate. And so... Uh, <laughs> So that was about our past, and then I wrote about our present. As time went on, our love it did grow to the people around us. We wanted to show that God and each other are all that we need to face all life's trials at last to succeed. And then we, we you know, ups and downs of uh, long-distance dating pre-internet. Um, now you could, like, FaceTime, but we couldn't. A year and a half, then one Sunday I said to ORU, that's the college I went to, that's where I am led, a new stage was coming and our future unstable, quote-unquote, put me first, says the Father, with his strength we are able to wait and lean on his perfect love, getting our help from heaven above. Although I, I misspelled heaven and I was a theology student. <laughs> Dork. But... So that was about our, like, today. That was, this was right before Christmas. I was coming home just in time for Christmas break, the card. And then I wrote, the bottom half of the card was about the future. Here we go. While looking back, a vision I see, a church packed with people. You're standing with me there at the altar, gazing down at your face. I realize we've made it. We've run the long race. With a confident voice and a tear in my eye, I cry a lot. I cry, big letters, I do. Merry Christmas. There you go. That's my little card. I'm a poet. I know. You got you to gotta milk that for all it's worth. All right, so I, uh, I was able to communicate with words on a card my feelings, right? Now, whether she was there or not, it's possible for her to feel, to know, to see, to think about me because of words. Well, we're in week three. This is a series called Follow Me. Those are words Jesus said, follow me. And we're looking at what that really means. And week one, we looked at what Jesus said when he said, I want you to come and be my disciples. What's a disciple? We saw it week one. A disciple is simply an apprentice. An apprentice is a learner. And so what it means to follow Jesus is relationship was the first word. Growth is the second word. And the third word was what? change. All two of you remember. 
Relationship growth and change. To apprentice to Jesus, to learn of Jesus, to follow him means that we grow to know him and then we grow in our knowledge of what he said and what he teaches and then we actually follow him. We live like him and that is change. And so now we know what a, what a disciple is. The second week we looked at how we follow Jesus together. How am I actually going to grow and learn and change and be transformed. And we saw God's tool, his primary tool for you and for me, is togetherness. It's the church. And the church is a bad word for some people. I think it's a beautiful word. Jesus said, I am establishing the church. No enemy is going to come against it. And so the church is the place where broken, growing, in process people meet together around Jesus. And so we grow together in him. We learn together his ways, and we challenge each other to live like him. So if you're not a part of a church, it's really hard to be an apprentice to Jesus because Jesus designed us to grow each other in him. We saw last week God's primary tool to grow you will be other people. I want to meet with God. Good. Meet with another Jesus follower because God is going to use them, men and women, young and old, to shape you. God uses us for us. Remember, it's never Jesus and me. It's Jesus and we. It's Jesus together. So this week, though, I want to look at another primary tool that God's given us so that we would know him, and it's words, the Bible. I want us to look at the Bible. Some of you have a copy. Some of you have an app. If you don't already have a copy of the book that I wrote, Good News Today and Tomorrow. It's out in the lobby, and it's for free. We printed it for you, and it's on the welcome table. Pick up a copy. If you read uh, the book or picked it up, this is chapter 3, the Bible, Learning God's Ways. So the goal is that you just read. It's like six pages. Read it before you show. It'll get your mind thinking, and then the message will be totally different but connected to the text. We want us to grow each other by Words. All right. Now, words. How do we know what we know? I'm a resident philosopher here. How do you know what you know? We don't think about it. It's words. How do you get here? Words. Most of what you know is communicated through language. And words are the communication tool for relationship growth and change. And sometimes we forget, we take for granted that words have shaped us. Your schooling has shaped you. Spoken words have shaped you. We are where we are. We are who we are because of the power of language. What if life were completely silent in that you could never read anything that anyone wrote and never hear anything that anyone said and had absolutely no input, no connection to anyone? Uh, life would be quite different, wouldn't it? But God has given us this powerful thing called words. So you can get to know, you can get to know someone through a song. You ever feel like you know an artist because you heard their song? Let me give you a tip. You don't know them. <laughs> you don't, but you do. Or like a card or poetry or a book or a conversation. We take for granted your life is, is being shaped by the power of of words. Words shape our world. And what we want to do is look at the power of God's words to reshape our world. If you don't believe me, look at what one statement from the Bible. We're going to be all, usually we take one passage of the Bible, a small part, and we break it down and we look at it. Today I want to look more big picture, so you may be flipping all over the place or just write down the references and you could pick them up uh, and read them later. James one of the letters in the Bible, James, chapter 3, verse 5, 9 and 10 says this. The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Now, this is a poetic statement here. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. He's not talking about a forest fire. He's talking about the tongue. Words have the power to start a forest fire like a spark can take out hundreds of thousands of acres and kill lives. One word, one phrase, one conversation could set your life on fire in a negative way. And then, and then James a little later goes on, with the tongue, this is what we could do. We praise our Lord and Father. And with the tongue, 
we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And then he's speaking to the church. Remember, the language of church is brother and sister. We're not just friends. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. You see, words are the tools of relationship. And so God has given us a spark that could ignite things for good or for evil. With the tongue this morning, you were just praising God. All the earth will shout your praise. Great are you, Lord. You were given words by God to worship him. And at the same token, you can leave here and rip your brother and sister, your husband, your wife, your kids apart with that same tongue. Words have power. God's given us the church, each other, but he's also given us words. And since this is true, God has also given us his word. So let's ask the question, what is the word of God? What's the word of God? Some of you have been taught, well, the word of God is the Bible. And that's absolutely true. The Bible is the word of God. The question is, though, what does that mean? And if you have a Bible, why should you look at the Bible differently than every other book that has words? Because if you look at, if you have a printed version, it's just, you know, a cover and words on a page. If you have an electronic version, it's just there. And any book in your Kindle or whatever looks kind of the same. It all has language, whether English or Spanish or whatever language you like to read in. What makes the Bible, though, different than every other book? And what makes his words different than everyone else's words? These are honest questions. So what I want us to do is look at seven things this morning. Seven things that we know about God and words and then hopefully it will stir us to take more seriously the Bible. I think we undervalue the power of the Bible to transform who we are as people. Just like we underestimate the power of our own words to speak life and death. First thing, write it down. God creates with words. What, what, what does it mean by the Bible is the word of God? It means that God... God creates. God's words are not just ordinary. They have creative force. Look at Genesis 1. This is the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. And that's where it starts. It doesn't start with you. It starts with God. God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God took DNA and molded it together. No. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And someone said, well, that's kind of a metaphor. God took matter that was and, and reshaped the matter. Well, that makes no sense, because where did the matter come from? God actually spoke things into existence. In other words, God's words have authority. They have action to them. When God says something, it's not just like you and me speaking. Although our words have some authority, God's words have all authority because when he speaks, universes come into being in the way that he imagined them in his mind and he says it, light, and light wasn't and light is. This is amazing. And if that doesn't impress you, then there's something wrong with you and not with God. God speaks and words Come and our worlds come into existence. So on some level, we know this is true. How do we know this is true? Because we are made in the image of God. Remember James said, how can we praise God and then tear down humans who bear God's likeness, God's image? So you and I, we know this is true because when we speak, we can create life-giving things and we can speak death into people. We can tear them down and we can lift them up. But our words have limited authority. In other words, when you speak, universes don't come into being, okay? You don't have that much authority. I can't even make chocolate cake. I'd love to say, chocolate cake! <laughs> it's, not, it's not there. It's not going to happen. My words, your words have limited authority. God's words have all authority. My point is that we need it. Why take seriously the word of God? Because when God says something, it has more meaning and more value than we usually appreciate. Second thing I want us to see is God shapes our thinking. 
with words. Not only does he make universes, he shapes the way we think. Romans 12, we looked at Romans in depth some months ago. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, again, family language, brothers and sisters, that's who we are, the church, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be, underline this, transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. God's will is knowable in our mind. And God shapes the way we think and live, and he can create a whole new version of, of us that's more in line with him through the power of words. If God impacts the way you think, everything will follow. His good and pleasing and perfect will. So how do I live in a way that pleases God? Well, it starts in the mind and in the pattern of thinking, which means, this is so elementary, but sometimes we don't forget. Like how often do you think about breathing? Only when you're out of breath. It's in a crisis where you're like, struggling to breathe, you know, like you went running for that chocolate cake. <laughs> and now you're like, whoo, wow, thank you, God, for air. You and I don't even think about the power of words and their creative force, but God in his goodness is reminding us words shape our world. And so your world is being shaped by the words that you hear, the words that you see, the words that you believe are shaping your world view. And as you view things, you will live. And so what God wants to do is he wants to renew our mind. Why? Because our mind has been corrupted by sin. When we believe a lie, what is sin? The essence of it is to believe a lie. God says to Adam and Eve, everything's yours. One thing's out of bounds. Why? I'm God. One thing's out of bounds. Then the serpent comes and says, did God really say you can't? Oh, and he told you something would happen. Oh, he's a liar. And they believed words, a lie. They acted on their belief, and it corrupted everything. So what we need to remember is as humans who are trying to love and follow the way of Jesus, we too are being corrupted by this influence that we have in our culture that is shaped with words, with books, with media, with thoughts, with conversations, with opinions. You are being cluttered with all of these things. And all of these things are either drawing you closer to the mind of God or they're pulling you away from the heart and the mind and the thought of God. But God says, I want you to know my good, pleasing, perfect will. You can know it so that you can live it. And it's going to happen when you allow your mind to sit under his mind and know it and then choose to believe of the two opinions. Who am I going to believe? I'm going to believe God. I'm not going to believe everyone else. And when we choose to believe God, it affects real world living. So learning God's words transform us in the mind. And that makes sense. Because if God can speak a solar system into existence by saying it, can't God speak something into our mind and shake us up? which is so encouraging. You can grow. It begins in your mind. All right, third thing. God accomplishes his will with words. How does God do what he does? He does it with words. Look at Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth. He's using words to give a word picture. So we get this. So the rains come down and and. Don't ret- they, they hit the ground. They water the earth and making it bud and flourish. So rain comes down and creates life so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So rain comes and people eat, which you don't normally make the connection with. Rain comes and the next thing you know it, my stomach is fed. Cause and then effect. So in the same way, my word goes out of my mouth and it won't return to me empty-handed. In other words, God says one thing, and suddenly, totally over here, someone's entire worldview can change because God said one word. It doesn't look like, how, how did rain lead to food? You can't see all of the process, but God's will happens through words. 
It will accomplish, this is God speaking, what I desire, it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Which, if that is true, and that's a quote from God through a prophet, if God sends words, what should that make us think about the Bible? If God is accomplishing his purposes by sending his word out so it will do all sorts of things, that same rain washes away impurities. That same rain you can collect and drink. That same rain takes care of the garden and the next thing you have food. That one drop can have so many effects. Why do we value the Bible so lowly if it is the word of God? We need to ask ourselves this honest question. See, God doesn't waste words. When God says something, it will accomplish it. So why the Bible? Do you know that God promises things in the Bible? For you, for me, God. Light, and there is light. This God promises things to those who will listen and follow him. That's why Jesus all the time is saying, if anyone has an ear... They're a human being, right? Because I've got two. No, if anyone has an ear, let them hear. God is saying things all the time. And he says, Jesus says phrases like that because there are people who hear what God is saying but are not paying any attention to what God is saying. And what God is saying to you and to me this morning is his words accomplish his will. I want to I wanna be where God is. I want to do his will. Okay, you can. God can renew your mind and begin to show you through words what he is doing. It also means when God says words of warning, it's a warning. So so, uh, why the Bible? Because the Bible provides promises, blessing, flourishing, life the way it's supposed to be lived. Why do I follow Jesus? It's the absolute best way to live. Some will say, "Well, well, what if in the end it was... It was all like hocus pocus and made up. And in the end, there's nothing. It didn't change a thing. Following Jesus is the best way to live. And if it leads to eternity with him, which I believe it does, fantastic. But it's still the best way to live. Why do we not pay attention to God's words when when they provide blessing and warning? All right, I hope you see a pattern. Words matter. Words are important. All right, number four, if you didn't get it yet, God touches our deepest issues with words. So there are deep things in our soul that are troubling. God even touches those with words. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. Again, poetic words that show what it does. It, God's word, penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. God's words judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. We could just stop there. Nothing is hidden from God. And his words are cutting in. Everything is uncovered, laid bare before the eyes of him who must, who, whom we must give an account. So God's words are sent and they're, they're, they accomplish his word and his will. And how does, how does he do that? It gets into the places where we don't know how we're going to change or how we're going to do what's right. And God can step in. So the Bible is not a novel. And the Bible has history, but it's not a history book. And it's not a philosophy book. And it's not an ethics book. It's the book of God. God knows everything about us. Why? He made us even in his own image, and he knows himself. So God knows you. Everything is exposed. Everything is laid bare. And guess what? God started you, and God knows the end of you. And in the end, you and I are going to be in the presence of God to give an account for this gift he gave us called life. You're going to give an account, and I'm going to give an account. And here's the beautiful thing. We can let God's words come in and reshape us and cut and divide and heal and build up. And whatever you need, I'm saying, it's in God. Whatever you need, it's in God. And how do I know God? Through words. I would dare say, apart from words, there's no way of you knowing God. Now, I don't know why God has done it this way. 
But how would you know him apart from what he says and speaks? Just like that card, I can express who I am without being there. So when Carmen reads that card, in a real sense, I am there, even if I'm not physically present, because my words communicate relationship. Words are the tools by which we have all relationship. And so we need to think about, now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting around the surface because I just want to say, and then go straight to the burrito, read the Bible. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, we say that every week and so few of us actually read it. So there must be a reason that we're not reading the Word of God. There must be a reason we're not thinking about the Word of God. There must be reasons why we don't value the Word of God. There must be reasons why we're not sure that the Word of God is the Word of God. So I'm trying to get around to let you know that the power of words shape everything. And your intake of words are shaping the way you think. The way you think is the way you live. Why not infuse your life with God's words? Number five, God's, God prepares us with words. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, or the Bible, all Scripture is God-breathed, comes from God. And it's useful for what? Teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness or in the right way of God, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You can grow closer to God by reading, studying, looking, listening, hearing things about the Bible. You can get back on track. Because why? It corrects. It rebukes. It shows us the right way. It's God's tool for you and I to get back in line. God uses words to get us ready for action. How are you going to be a great neighbor this week? How are you going to be a great employee or employer this week? How are you going to be a great citizen this week? How are you going to be a great church person to the brothers and sisters in this community this week? How are you going to be human this week? The Bible can prepare you for the very real things you're going to face and the people that you're going to encounter in ways that no other book will. Parenting, work life, all of life affected by the Bible. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us everything about everything, but here's what the Bible does tell us. Everything God wants us to know about life in Him is in the Bible. Now, does God say things outside of the Bible? Well, absolutely. God's speaking words of direction all of the time. He's trying to communicate to you in various ways, not just in the Bible, by His Holy Spirit, which come next week, by His Holy Spirit, He's bringing truth to you that's in alignment with the Bible all the time. But how am I going to know it's God if I don't know the Bible? God's words are what we need. Number six, God expects us to learn and obey His words. So I started with God creates with words. That's all exciting and ethereal. Great. Wonderful. God shapes us. Great. He touches the deep parts. Great. But, but if God speaks, guess what? He expects you to listen. James 1, Now this is written to Jesus' followers. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Sometimes there are parts of the Bible that are poetry, hard to understand. Uh, there are prophetic words that are, take a little bit of time to think through. And then there's James Blunt. You know? Don't listen and think you got it. Do it. Period. And in the same way, we need to remember if God's given words and they shape life, who am I to neglect God's words? And who am I to go against God's words when they're for my life? Now, this is a lifelong pursuit. So I'm not saying, that you're like, man, the Bible's big and I'm new to Jesus or I'm pursuing, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure this out. And you're trying to tell me that like God's saying I, I need to know every word in the book and figure it out and understand it? I would say yes with this caveat. And for the rest of your life, he's going to grow you through it. So know whatever you know and be hungry for more. So God knows what you know of his words. And what he wants to do is expand your vocabulary. He wants to grow you in growth with him. And the way he does it is through 
words. I'm going to make a statement I believe to be true. If I'm overemphasizing it, forgive me. It's impossible to grow in God without the Bible. Now, there may be a possibility of someone on the island who never saw the book, never had the book. Okay, okay, okay. Hypothetical. I'm just going to go with this. You can't grow, I can't grow in God apart from the Bible. It is God's lifeline to us. And if I don't know his words, I don't know his heart. If I don't know his heart, how am I going to follow him? The only other alternative is for me to think what I think God is like, which is scary. Because your version of God and the revealed version of God are most often quite opposite. So we need God and we need his word. Number seven, and we're done. Jesus is the living word of God. We started with God creates with words, but then you have Jesus. He's also called the word of God. Look, John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. And the word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life. That life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. God didn't just create the universe with words. He didn't just speak in guide with words. Jesus is the living Word of God. Now, what does that mean? Colossians 1, 15 to 17. It's worth thinking about. The Son, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. In other words, I've never seen the Creator, but I have, if I've seen Jesus. He's the firstborn over all creation. It's not that Jesus was born. He is the first and most prominent in all creation. For in Jesus all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things are held together. So God speaks and the universe is created. But God in his Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, their creation, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, Spirit hovering over the waters, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, distinct, different, perfectly united. I don't get it. God, who is, shows himself in Jesus, eternal from the beginning, creator, no one like him, which is why I find it to be personally annoying when people make Jesus a religious figure. I say, if that's your version of Jesus, fantastic. You just have not read the Bible. If you read the Bible with any bit of seriousness, you can't put Jesus on the same leveling playing field with everyone else. If this is true, then he is first in prominence over all things, because by the way, he made it. And so if this is true, wouldn't I as a follower, follow me, says Jesus, who's the one calling you to follow him? Not me, not this church. The creator of all things is saying, guess what? You get to follow in my footsteps. And that means you get to be with me. And that means I get to reshape how you think. And that means I got things and purposes for you you never even thought about yet. And I get to push you in that direction. I'm going to grow you. And I'm going to show you. And I'm going to be with you. And, and my words will remain in you. This is why the Bible ought to be a huge value in the life of a Jesus father. Now, if you're not following Jesus yet, I totally get it. The book looks a little mixed up. When you first look at it, it's like, how am I supposed to even know this? Hang out. There's plenty of ways to grow and understand it. But if you're saying you follow Jesus and you don't value the Bible at all, I wonder how you're actually going to follow him. Seriously. So what we have are two things, and I need you to write this down. We have the written Word of God, which is the Bible. We have the living Word of God, which is Jesus himself. We need both. We need Jesus, and we need every word that Jesus has allowed us to know, and that is in the Bible. So you're invited to relationship, growth, and change. Now, now why, why should I this week value the Bible more than I did last week. Romans 15, 4. Gosh, this is so good. Everything that was written in the past, speaking of Scripture, 
everything that was written was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement, notice both words, endurance. You see people in the Bible going through hard stuff. It's not an easy road following God. But guess what? You're not the first person on the road. So there is encouragement when you see people stick it out and not give up on God. And the encouragement that they provide, we might have hope. The Bible is a book of hope. It's not a lecture. It's not a suggestion. It's the book that gives us hope. Why? I see God in the Bible. I see myself in the Bible. I see Jesus most clearly in the Bible. I see the future of the world in the Bible. I see my own trends. I see promises. I see warnings. All these things should give us hope that I'm not just trying to guess my life. I can ground my life. And that's my hope for you, that you would actually follow Jesus by grounding your thinking in the Word of God. Now, I didn't even say how to read the Bible because I did that in chapter 3 in the book. So, okay, you can, you can read words. There are websites absolutely free to help guide you in knowing the Bible. You can go to the Bible Project right now and watch a cool video on every book of the Bible, every theme of the Bible, every key word in the Bible. And by watching your screen begin to get your mind wrapped up, not to replace the book, but so when you go to the Bible, you can say like, you know what? Now I get it more. I'll give you a tip. I do this for a living. I have multiple theology degrees and I watch the videos on the Bible Project before reading the book of the Bible every time because they're cool. And they help me think about the big picture and the themes and the clues. And so I'm not throwing out tools that are like, hey, that's for you guys. And I'm using them. And there's so much more. And I, I encourage you, read the Bible. All right, the question that could drive this week. What's keeping you from growing in God through the Bible? Because few of us are reading it, even fewer are studying it. Uh, even fewer are meditating, which is the picture of a cow chewing repetitively to get all the nutrients out. They just chew, 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 chew. Which means you just, you just think about it and think about it and think about it, think about it and analyze it and write it out, think about it and listen to it and think about it until I get a grasp of what this means for me. If so few are doing it, there's got to be a reason or reasons. Can I just ask you, ask the Holy Spirit to be honest with you about your reasons for devaluing the Bible and address them. Some of you say, Jose, I would love to read the Bible if I actually believed it was true. Okay, so you have a question. That's totally cool. Why not pursue that question honestly? Do you know there are honest answers that you can wrestle with about the Bible and what it says about itself? Well, there are contradictions, okay? Show me them. Do you even know what they are? Are they? Are they apparent contradictions or language contradictions because of how things are translated and concepts we misunderstand? All of this stuff, there may be good reasons. Can I just say, can you get beyond having questions and address them? Because if this is legit, this is for you. And this book will change your life because it will bring you into relationship and it will bring you to growth and it will bring you to change, all right? Now, we're going to eat a burrito, so I need you to stand. I need you to stand. And we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to now take these few moments. Don't go anywhere yet, please, because this, isn't, this is a tee up to respond to the living God who's alive and here. So here's how it's going to go if you're new here. We're going to sing some songs and begin to think with words, prayers back to God. In a little bit, we're going to go to the table. Brandon will lead us to when we go to pick up the bread and the cup, symbols of the living word of God, Jesus Christ. We're going to celebrate baptism. Some of you, in response to what you've heard, you've heard that baptism is the primary way we say to the world and ourselves that we are Jesus' followers. So every month we fill up a tank with water 
and we invite you, if you're following Jesus, the first thing you do, we say, I didn't do this the first thing, no problem. The first thing you do today is obey God. Don't just hear his words, do them. And if that's you this morning, you've chosen to follow the way of Jesus, but you've not been baptized in water, when we go to the table, we're gonna invite you to go over to the tank over here, meet with one of our leaders and pray with you, and in humble obedience, do the word of God because there's blessing in it and warning when we don't obey. So let's, let's not just hear words, let's do them. Lord, we give our lives again over to you. And with our words, we want to express what our heart is saying. And then with our lives, we want to live out the things that we now believe to be true. Jesus, you alone are the Son of God. And we want to follow you. Help us, Jesus, we pray.